Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. Very pleased to have Dr. Jonathan Chanzer, Senior Vice President for Research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, join us to discuss the Abraham Accords and Jordan's unsustainable position. Dr. Chanzer will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Dr. Jonathan Chanzer. Thank you very much. Great to be with everyone today. Uh, this uh, discussion today is based on a research memo that I produced uh, in December of last year. It was not an easy uh, piece to write. Uh, I've long been uh, a proponent of uh, Jordan-Israel ties and certainly have appreciated uh, the relationship between the United States and Jordan. However, uh, in recent years, it has really become uh, plain to me. It's been it's become obvious to me that we've got a problem. Um, the problem has manifested itself primarily through rhetoric, although recently, uh, perhaps also in action. Uh, in the headlines right now, we see that the Jordanians have refused to join the Negev summit. This is, of course, a, uh, a structure that was put in place in the aftermath of the Abraham Accords, uh, where uh, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, Morocco and the United States and Israel all joined together to try to put some meat on the bone, to provide some additional structure to those 2020 uh, peace agreements, normalization agreements uh, that uh, were engineered by the Trump administration. Uh, the good news is, is that uh, there was just a meeting of those working groups. There were six different areas that they worked on, and they are working uh, to put some meat on the bone. The bad news is, is that the Jordanians refuse to take part. What makes this all the more shocking is, of course, that Jordan was seen as the warm peace that Israel enjoyed, dating all the way back to the 1994 peace agreement uh, that the two countries signed. Things had been going rather well. Uh, the Israelis were providing gas and water and intelligence and security assistance. The United States was providing additional financial and military assistance to the Jordanians. All of that was serving to keep the Hashemite kingdom intact. Um, and uh, of course, the Jordanians did not necessarily get everything they wanted out of this deal. It is still an impoverished country. It is a country that lacks natural resources, so they have to rely on um, energy imports from the likes of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Uh, they continue to rely on the Gulf states for cash injections in order to remain solvent. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, these, uh, this agreement dating back to 90, 1994 has served the Hashemite kingdom well. Uh, and yet what we see right now is uh, that uh, the Jordanians are veering off in very much the wrong direction. I wrote the report. It's called Neither Here Nor There, Jordan's Ambivalence Toward the Abraham Accords. Um, I, I wrote this in anticipation of really a personality conflict above all else. Uh, certainly, we can go and look at the track record of the Jordanians and some of their rhetoric. But the big issue that I saw looming was that Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, the incoming prime minister of Israel, had just earned the right to form a government. Um, and for the prior year, things had gone relatively well. I don't want to say that they were much improved, but they had stabilized between Jordan and Israel. And the reason for that was because uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and King Abdullah have rather tense ties. Uh, for the, let's say, the second half of Benjamin Netanyahu's last time in government, basically from 2009 until 2021, um, the second half of that was really dominated by Yossi Cohen, the head of the Mossad, who used to run interference and essentially manage the relationship between Israel and Jordan because the king uh, did not uh, really want to speak with Bibi. Uh, but that was really not the end of it. Um, what if we really go and look back, um, there have been a number of very tense moments uh, where the uh, Jordanians have um, excoriated Israel 
for a range of um, of things that I don't think we can blame Israel for necessarily. Uh, the lack of progress uh, in terms of peace between Israel and the Palestinians, certainly not Israel's fault uh, alone uh, or even Israel's fault entirely, but that is the way that the Jordanian um, uh, government has framed it in years past. Um, when the United States was considering moving its embassy to Jerusalem, Jordanians called it a red line that would have a catastrophic uh, impact. Uh, when Netanyahu who was preparing to annex portions of uh, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank in 2020, uh, the king warned of a massive conflict. Um, of course, that was thwarted by the Abraham Accords, but uh, could be back on the table now, and it'll be interesting to see what the Jordanians say and how they react. Um, there was a time where, as I mentioned, uh, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett claimed that the Netanyahu government had uh, destroyed the relationship and then they were fixing it. But of course, we've not seen uh, significant improvements, even with uh, new uh, leaders in place. Um, in 2016, uh, at the UN General Assembly, King Abdullah placed the blame entirely on Israel for lack of progress. Um, and that uh, he was saying that peace is a conscious decision. Israel has to embrace it, or eventually be engulfed in a sea of hatred in a region of turmoil. That's that's some serious drama right there. Um, in 2017, after a Jordanian stabbed an Israeli security guard at a residential complex at the um, Israeli embassy compound in Amman, uh, the Jordanians held uh, the Israeli security guard um, uh, responsible for shooting his attacker in self-defense, and that led to a pretty significant standoff, a diplomatic standoff. This, of course, was exacerbated when Israel installed metal detectors on the Temple Mount after two Israeli policemen were killed by gunmen um, who were returning from prayer. In other words, the Jordanians seem to be blaming Israel for their response to, uh, to aggression. And this is, of course, not an easy thing for Israel to stomach. Now, a lot of this is stemming uh, from the uh, Jordanian role um, in uh, on the Temple Mount. Uh, they are, of course, the custodians of, uh, of the Temple Mount. This was something that uh, the Israelis enabled the Jordanians to do. Um, that we wanted to, I think, with the help of the United States, uh, dating back to that 1994 peace agreement, we wanted to make sure that uh, calm prevailed on the Temple Mount. This is, of course, a, uh, a very sensitive site, uh, holy to both uh, Jews and Muslims alike. Uh, and so I think the Israelis rather graciously enabled the Jordanians to maintain this custodian role. Uh, but I think it's backfired in recent years, and I think the Israelis are certainly coming to that conclusion. Um, during the 2021 war between Israel uh, and Hamas, uh, just before the eruption of conflict, as uh, the Israeli police were trying to uh, quell unrest on the Temple Mount, uh, the Jordanian government accused Israel and its uh, special forces and its police of being barbaric. Um, they described the actions taken by security forces as, quote, violations against the mosque to attacks on warshippers. Uh, and Ayman al Safadi, the jo Jordanian foreign minister, uh, slammed Israel at the Arab League, saying that the Jewish state was, quote, playing with fire, unquote. All of these things, I think, um, are, I should underscore here, they, they certainly don't belie or they don't underscore or, or they contrast rather with the uh, with the Jordanian role that is expected of them. Uh, in other words, that role is to play a buffer in the Middle East to prevent conflict from breaking out, uh, to ensure greater stability. This was always the, the role uh, envisioned for the Jordanians dating back to 1994, even before that, um, as the Jordanians cemented their relationship with the United States. This is simply not the case right now. If anything, it seems as if the Jordanian government is taking sides with the likes of Hamas uh, or Iran. Their rhetoric sounds very similar. Uh, and as one Israeli official joked to me, you can almost uh, schedule 
um, the a ratcheting up of tensions between the Hashemite kingdom and Israel, that would be every Ramadan. It's during that time that uh, more Muslims wish to uh, ascend to the Temple Mount. The Israelis are uh, keen to make sure that numbers are at least monitored, if not limited to some extent. This doesn't mean that uh, Muslims aren't able to pray on the Temple Mount. It's a question of volume. It's a question of number. And uh, when Israel engages in policies that limit, uh, it elicits a rather nasty response from the Jordanians when Hamas and other militant groups start to stoke unrest and the Israelis respond. The Jordanians uh, don't try to um, have calm prevail, but rather uh, in many ways exas uh, exacerbate some of uh, those sentiments. I would say that uh, perhaps for me among the most shocking was the comment in September 20th of last year when King Abdullah got up in front of the General Assembly and he charged that Christianity in the Holy City, meaning Jerusalem, is under fire. The rights of churches in Jerusalem are threatened. This cannot continue. This, of course, is rather ironic, given the the uh, the brain drain that we're seeing from Christians across the Middle East. Um, uh, Israel has carved out, I think, a special place for Christianity um, uh, in their country, and it is uh, it's certainly disturbing to see rhetoric along those lines. Now, all of this takes place as we see profound change taking place across the Middle East. Uh, the Abraham Accords, this was the uh, the agreements engineered by the Trump administration in 2020 with the UAE and Bahrain and Morocco and Sudan, I think um, have signaled a significant shift in the Middle East. We see countries like Saudi Arabia sitting on the fence, perhaps mulling their entry into this construct. Now, it's not all happening at once, and I'm not saying that peace is breaking out across the region. But it is striking to me that Jordan is standing on the sidelines of that, especially when they have such important relationships with the United States, with Israel, and uh, with the UAE and the Saudis. In other words, uh, financially, um, in terms of uh, natural resources, the oil that they get from these Arab states, the gas and the water they get from Israel, the money that they get from the Gulf states and from the United States, including a recent MOU signed between um, uh, uh, Jordan and the United States. All of this would suggest that Israel, uh, that, that rather that Jordan really needs to get on board with this new construct. And instead, we see them sitting out of the Negev summit. We see them, by the way, back in 2020, they refused to attend the signing on the White House lawn. It has been uh, one display of rejectionism after another. And this, of course, coming from the country that was traditionally viewed as the warm peace, certainly as compared to Egypt. And Egypt, we can say, after years of having a very frigid peace with Israel, has turned a corner. Uh, and so now, uh, as we see, uh, every time a conflict erupts in the Gaza Strip, it is Egypt that tries to bring calm uh, back to the region, and they have a close and trusted relationship with the Israeli success of Israeli governments. And so Jordan now has the distinction of being the coldest peace uh, with Israel in the region. This, of course, is not good news. This is something that the United States should wish to change. Um, however, we see that uh, Washington continues to view uh, the Hashemite kingdom as something that is too weak to fail, too weak to challenge. Uh, year after year, the administration, whether it's Democrat or Republican, Congress, Democrat or Republican, generally refuses to engage with the Jordanians, refuses uh, to push them into a better place with Israel. This is not to say, of course, that Jordan needs to agree with every policy that Israel has adopted. Um, uh, they can certainly take issue with it. It's the public excoriation of Israel. It is that very nasty public rhetoric that I think continues to undermine peace. And we certainly hear from Israeli officials right now, quietly at least, uh, where they're complaining. And they're saying that uh, this is unsustainable and that Jordan is not uh, appreciative of the assistance that they get from Israel. Uh, again, it's not to say that everything that Israel does um, should please Jordan, uh, but uh, the, most of these things are being done uh, very much in accordance with longstanding Israeli security policy. Um, and uh, freedom of religion continues at the Temple Mount. 
uh, and the Israelis continue to enable the Jordanians to have that significant role in the Waqf. I need to wrap up here in, in a minute or two, but what I would say here in conclusion is that the United States does have a role to play. I should say that the Saudis have a role to play, so does the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Egypt. They can certainly push uh, the Jordanians to uh, dial back on that rhetoric and to engage more constructively to join the Negev summit uh, and to take part in these new constructs related to uh, the Abraham Accords. This would, I think, be one positive step. Uh, but I do think that it does uh, fall heavily on the United States uh, to engage more robustly. Uh, one thing that I've thought about very recently is, of course, the fact that uh, after the United States won the Cold War, dating back, of course, this is dating back to the early 1990s, when the United States emerged as the strong horse, so to speak, uh, that was when the United States had, I would say, the greatest leverage to push the Palestinians towards the Oslo Accords, to push the Jordanians toward their peace agreement several years later. Uh, when the United States appears strong, when the United States appears ascendant, I think we will have greater leverage in terms of building out these constructs and trying to create a region uh, that is more oriented around peace rather than confrontation. So my hope is that this is something that the administration could potentially capitalize on with the defeat of Russia uh, on the battlefields of Ukraine. Uh, but if that's not the case, uh, then perhaps with China, that will be a tougher conflict uh, to imagine. Uh, certainly not something that uh, any of us welcome, but uh, those sorts of challenges can sometimes breed opportunity. Um, I'll end there. I think I've uh, ended up here at 15 minutes, and I'm very happy to take your questions. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, the first question is from Daniel Pipes asking, how much is the problem you describe due to popular sentiments and how much personally due to the king's wishes? It's a, uh, obviously a great question coming from Daniel, uh, who's a longtime observer uh, of this dynamic. I would say it's uh, in large part due to the fact that the Palestinian population makes up a majority of Jordan. Uh, the Jordanians will, behind closed doors, say that it's perhaps 50 percent publicly. They'll talk about numbers that are quite lower. I think the reality is that uh, Jordan is probably somewhere around 85 percent Palestinian. Uh, and so it's just not feasible, uh, at least in the mind of the king, to come out and embrace Israel, to give it that bear hug that perhaps we're seeing from uh, from the likes of the UAE or Bahrain. Uh, it doesn't sit well in Jordan. Uh, when I was there in September doing research for this uh, memo, uh, I saw uh, a lot of bumper stickers and signage rejecting Israel, calling on Jordan not to take gas, for example, uh, from Israel, saying it was occupation gas, meaning that they would rather not heat their homes, not be able to cook food if it meant taking energy from Israel. This is, of course, not a good sign. And I think something that the king has to bear in mind, or at least this is what he's doing, um, he, you know, he, he wants to make sure that a country that is already somewhat unstable with a regular rotation of, uh, of governments that have been brought down by protests, uh, that he doesn't anger the population. This, of course, I think um, when one thinks about it at the end of the day, this is a king and the king can strike a contract that he wishes with his subjects. I think this is a demonstration of uh, some waffling on the part of, of the king. But I will also say that when one looks back, and I read his autobiography in preparation for writing this um, uh, uh, this memo, the king, I think, was, is somewhat predisposed to antagonism with Israel. He blames Israel for just about everything, does not hold the Palestinian Authority or Hamas accountable for their actions. He seems to be inclined in this direction. Uh, and again, I think this is where the United States has a significant role to play. Thank you so much. Carrie Hillebrand asks, the Jordanian uh, mon monarchy is propped up by a Bedouin minority with a growing Palestinian majority that is politically and economically suppressed. What is the danger that the Hashemite regime will be deposed in the near term? 
Um, I've had this question asked to me a lot, and I think uh, the answer is it's not very likely. I think you know the king uh, is supported uh, probably first and foremost by Israel. Uh, and by the way, we saw this during the Black September crisis of uh, of the early 1970s. For those that recall, when the Syrians were uh, threatening to destabilize Jordan, it was Israel that stepped in. And I think Israel uh, has been at Jordan's side during the ISIS crisis and some of the uh, the uh, Arab Spring um, tumult that we saw during the past decade. All of this, I think, you know, despite all the tensions, Israel will be there and uh, will not let the kingdom fall, nor will the Saudis, nor will the United States, and and, and nor will the UAE. And, and this gets back, I think, to that key point that I'm making, is that this is the natural alliance structure that I've just described for Jordan, and they're rejecting it. Right. They continue to stand aside and to uh, and, and to eschew this uh, uh, Abraham Accord structure that you know only serves to benefit their long term stability. So it makes very little sense from a strategic perspective. Maybe from the perspective of populism, you can understand why the king is doing this. But if his goal is long term survivability and to ensure that his son takes the reins after he's gone, then Israel. The United States, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, they're the only game in town. Uh, and so this was, in fact, the, the primary motivation for my writing this report. Um, I don't think that uh, any of that kind of instability, you know, that could potentially topple the regime is likely as long as they stand by the king's side. Absolutely. And uh, we have a question here from David Levine. Just just a quick prediction. Uh, could you predict what would follow if anything did happen to King Abdullah? No, you're saying that's unlikely, but I think it's unlikely. I mean, look, there are uh, those that have potentially uh, posed a challenge to him as half brother Hamza. There was a reported coup attempt from I, I think it was about a year and a half ago. I'm not sure it really was a coup attempt. It looked really more like a family squabble. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood continues to pose something of a challenge to the regime, although they have uh, fashioned themselves to be something of the loyal opposition uh, rather than an outright antagonist uh, to the king. Uh, there are, of course, uh, you know, democracy advocates and human rights advocates that also uh, have challenged the, uh, the kingdom. But what's really interesting to me is that when you look back over the last 10, 15 years, you look at the uh, 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 the Arab Spring uprisings, you look at the trend lines, we could say, uh, I think, across the board that uh, no king has been toppled. Monarchies have been typically respected. It is the republics that have uh, endured the tumult, and that is an interesting trend to watch. So I just, again, I don't see it as being terribly likely, but I've identified some of the potential challengers unlikely as they may be. Thank you so much. Robin Santiago asks, what do you think the U.S. could do to Im help improve these relationships, especially since the street seems to be very anti-normalization? Yeah, I mean, look, th there are a few things that uh, that I note in uh, in the report, you know, border security being one of them, working together with the Jordanians and Israelis. I mean, it should be noted here that uh, Israel's longest border um, is with Jordan. And uh, the Israelis need that border secured, so they need to work with the Jordanians. The Jordanians have their own border security problems right now as the Iran-backed militias uh, continue to destabilize uh, the country. In, in particular, we've seen an uptick in the smuggling of Captagon, uh, a very addictive drug that is uh, plaguing the streets of Jordan as well as other uh, countries around the Middle East. Uh, so I think the United States can engage uh, more fully uh, with Jordan and Israel to ensure better border uh, security. I think uh, we should be looking at additional assistance, financial assistance. And by the way, it doesn't have to be the United States, but we should be working with uh, the Saudis, uh, who are a bit more ambivalent, by the way, about investing in Jordan than, for example, the UAE. So there could be more that we could do of course, we've got our own tie, uh, tense ties right now with the Saudis. Uh, but I think that working with those that have the means to support Jordan financially, we should certainly be doing so. We also have an ongoing effort right now to do something called ally shoring, where we're trying to find new supply chains outside of China 
um, and to support businesses uh, in countries that we trust more. And uh, Jordan could certainly be one of those. I've identified pharmaceuticals, for example, as something that the Jordanians could produce perhaps with Israeli assistance and to export them to the United States. They have a, a fairly decent pharmaceutical sector that I think could be exploited. So there's lots of opportunity here, but it will require the United States to face this problem. Up until now, we've really just not seen an honest reckoning on the part of specifically the State Department and the Pentagon, who are in fact the greatest champions of the Hashemite kingdom, regardless of their behavior. Understood. Thank you. Uh, J.R. Pride asks, how would the annexation of the land in Judea and Samaria resurface despite the Abraham Accords? Um, look, this current government uh, continues to uh, hint uh, at additional actions that could be taken in, uh, in the West Bank and Judea and Samaria. Um, and this, of course, would, I think, uh, exacerbate the tensions that we've already seen uh, between Jordan and Israel. You can see Jordan's reaction just to um, uh, Itamar ben Gvir's uh, walk on the Temple Mount. Um, I think, by the way, that Jordan's reaction, the international reaction to that event, was wildly overblown. This is, of course, sovereign Israeli soil, um, and this is also the holiest site in Judaism, the idea that a Jewish Israeli would walk on this uh, on, uh, on this holy site should not be an outrage to the Jordanians, and it should not be an outrage to anybody else for that matter. Uh, but now imagine if there were uh, a move to annex or to change the status quo in the West Bank, which has been the red line that Jordan has established. You could imagine how this would impact relations. By the way, I would also note that it may not uh, portend well for uh, Israeli-UAE relations. It was the UAE that offered peace and normalization in exchange for Israel not annexing uh, parts of the West Bank. That was back in 2020. So it, you could see more than just Jordan being impacted by this. And it's for that reason that I think uh, Netanyahu, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, is going to have to be very careful how he navigates uh, this. Uh, normalization is still important for Israel, um, even if territorial gain may also be. Thank you. And in terms of that careful navigation, an anonymous attendee asks, can you comment on near term, uh, the near term future of the Jordanian Israeli relationship? Uh, the near term is tumultuous. The near term is not positive. And again, this is why I uh, I wrote this uh, this memo. Um, the the goal is to to point out here that things are likely to get worse before they get better. Things have been, as I mentioned, quite tense every Ramadan. Every time there's been a question uh, of uh, who goes where on the Temple Mount, uh, things have been tough. Every time there's been a uh, a conflict between Israel and Hamas, for example, things have gotten uh, uh, acrimonious. Uh, things have been difficult since March. While the Israelis have tried to quell some uh, significant unrest in uh, the West Bank, the operation known as Wave Breaker that Israel is uh, conducting in the West Bank has not sat well with the Jordanians either. So none of these things bode well. And now with Netanyahu back as prime minister, we're going to need to see who steps up as that intermediary. Someone will need to speak um, with the Jordanians and will need to be at a high level. So it will be interesting to see who does it now. Yossi Cohen is now the former uh, uh, Mossad director, so it's not likely that he will be the one. Maybe it's David Barnea, the new Mossad director. Maybe it's someone else. But uh, I think a lot will hinge on who uh, Netanyahu sends um, and whether they are able to build that strong relationship. But again, more importantly, I think the United States needs to start uh, to engage, uh, to warn the Jordanians not to uh, engage in this kind of rhetoric, uh, and perhaps to demonstrate a bit more strength on the world stage, as that in the past has really uh, resonated with uh, the Arab street. Absolutely. I'm so sorry. I know we're running out of time, but Barry Werner just asked a question directly about that. Can our foreign policy work if we only use carrots and no sticks? Won't we encourage the king to play both sides? On the one side, he is placating the Palestinians, and on the other side, he is protected by the Abraham Accords peace process. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and, and by the way, I mean, I think the, the Jordanians um, you know, know that no one wants to challenge this peace agreement. 
uh, dating back to 90, 1994. And so they actually can, as I, as I said in the, in the title of the, uh, of the report, they are neither here nor there. They can live in this interesting, weird gray zone where they're not uh, uh, acting like a peace partner, but they're enjoying the benefits of peace. Um, and as a result, what we've seen is that they have emerged as in this sort of third category of countries that uh, are against normalization, such as uh, you know Algeria or Kuwait, for example. But the difference is, is they need United States assistance. They need the, the help that they get from Israel. They need the resources that they get from the UAE, which is a partner of the Abraham Accords. And so that's where I think this is just simply unsustainable. But it does come down, I think, at the end of the day to America as the senior partner in all of this and the architect of the regional constructs that prevail today. Now, they could be threatened by China. They could be threatened by Russia. They could be threatened by an American departure from the Middle East. But at least for now, uh, America is still the superpower, and it should be willing to wield the influence that it has. This doesn't need to be stick per se, but it cannot be only carrot. There need to be warnings. There needs to be a sense of consequence for the Jordanians if we are to try to improve uh, the current dynamic. Absolutely, thank you so much. Before we go, can you tell our viewers where we can find some more of your work? Sure, you can find my work uh, at uh, fdd.org. Uh, I'm the Senior Vice President for Research there, and you should be able to find my report, uh, again, titled Neither Here Nor There. Uh, you can also find my work uh, rather easily on Twitter, and that's just at J Shanzer, J S C H A N Z E R. All right. Thank you so much. We've come to the close of our webinar and podcast. Thank you again, Dr. Shanzer, for joining us today. Thank you. Of course, for our viewers, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings email coming out over the weekend. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.